Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our community conversation event hosted by Marin County Health and Human Services and the County of Marin. I am Lynn Hendricks, Public Information Officer for the County of Marin, and I have the honor of serving as your moderator this evening. The purpose of tonight's event is to bring together some of Marin's top experts in public health and emergency planning to dive into that topic of hospital surge. Our slate of panelists will provide an overview of COVID-19 activity in Marin, reveal how COVID-19 is affecting our hospitals now, and discuss Marin County's medical network and how it might be prepared for a rapid increase in future coronavirus cases. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone watching that you can stay up to date with the latest COVID-19 informa information in Marin by visiting the Coronavirus in Marin website at marinhhs.org slash coronavirus for English or marinhhs.org slash coronavirus dash ES for Spanish. On our website, you can also subscribe to receive daily status updates from Marin County Health. Simply click on, click on the subscribe button at the top of your website. In addition, you can now receive daily updates by texting. Oops. <laughs> you can text Marin COVID to 468311 to now receive our daily status updates by text message. Now, this evening, we're going to hear from four community leaders talking about our efforts to prepare for medical surge. And I'd like to introduce them to you now. Um, representing our Marin County Board of Supervisors, we have our board president, Supervisor Katie Rice. We also have our deputy public health officer for the County of Marin, Dr. Lisa Santora. Representing the Marin County Emergency Medical Services Agency, we have our medical director, Dr. Dustin Ballard. And finally, representing Marin County Fire and also the North Bay Incident Management Team, Deputy Chief Mark Brown. Each of our panelists will start by providing an overview of where we are in the coronavirus response and as well our efforts on hospital surge planning. Once we conclude, we will then open it up to some Q&A uh, answering a lot of the questions that you, our viewers, submitted earlier today. So now I'd like to turn it over for introductory re remarks from Supervisor Katie Rice. Thanks, Lainey. Thanks, Lainey, and um, welcome and good evening to everyone. I hope you and your family are managing as well as possible during this really difficult time. If you're uh, someone like me who is having to manage alone, I hope that you're finding ways to connect with friends, with family, with loved ones, um, in, other, in some other mode and medium that, that keeps you connected to the people who you can support and who can support you. It's so important. So we're dealing with a threat that I'm sure none of us ever imagined. It's invisible, it's insidious, and it's incredibly dangerous for some of our most fragile, for our elder, elderly, for folks who are already at risk. To combat it, we're using the one tool that we have that we know that works, and that's sheltering in place. And it's preventing the spread of the virus, and it's buying our healthcare system time. We know this has not been easy for folks at so many levels, economically, socially, emotionally, but it's absolutely necessary and it is working. So um, I think first what I wanna do is, is really thank folks. Um, on behalf of our Board of Supervisors, on behalf of the entire county, um, our appreciation to the many folks who are playing key roles in fighting COVID-19. Our healthcare workers, our first responders, our dispatchers um, who, who are taking the calls, um, law enforcement as well. And our public employees, many of them, many who have stepped into disaster service roles and are doing jobs that they never um, imagined taking on. And then there's the many folks out in our community uh, who have become now recognized as truly our essential service workers. They are now our heroes, and deservedly so. Our grocery store clerks, um, the folks who are delivering goods, folks who are still driving the buses and providing the public transit so, that so many depend on. And thank you also to our volunteers. Mern County has an incredible volunteer workforce, always has. And once again, our volunteers are stepping up to work in the food banks, the food pantries, to deliver meals, finding a place where they can offer their services, their need to someone else. So we thank you. And then for all of us collectively, 
Residents across the county, as we adhere to the shelter in place order, as we stick to our neighborhoods, as we stay true to social distancing, we are saving lives by staying home. We've come together as a community in such an impressive way by our individual actions, our collective effort, our commitment to each other and to our community, we're flattening the curve. We are putting ourselves and our entire county in a better position to begin, to begin a return to normal when the time is right. Before I hand off to Dr. Santura, I just wanna comment on Marin's leadership role in this pandemic. Marin's public health officers stepped forward with five other Bay Area counties to put the first stay at home order in place in the state and in the nation. We are modeling with that action, fact-based, science-based decision-making. Our public officers will contend, continue to lead us and we will continue to support them. We also have an incredible team of individuals and you're gonna hear from some of them tonight, folks with expertise in public health, in medical care, in disaster response and preparedness from the public and private sectors. They are working together leading our local response and coordinating with our colleague counties as we approach this challenge as a region. So to close, I just wanna say I'm, I'm so extremely proud of the individuals at work, of our collective effort as a county. I'm also confident that not only will we continue to manage this crisis well, we will get through it and we will be stronger for it. So thank you and I'm happy to hand over to Dr. Santora now. Good evening, everyone. My name is Lisa Santora, and I'm the Deputy Health Officer for the county. Thank you for being with us tonight. And just like Supervisor Rice, I wanted to leave with gratitude. Um, we are all thankful for everyone who has been supporting our effort. Um, my first thanks goes to Dr. Matt Willis and the other Bay Area Health Officers who have led us in the nation um, in implementing aggressive community mitigation, mitigation strategies that supports where we are today and will help prevent the medical surge in our community that we're gonna be talking about later on in this um, video. Um, second, I just wanna thank my team, and there's probably many of you who don't even know you're on my team. When we are in our darkest moments, we look for the helpers, and I have found helpers everywhere from all four corners of this county, every uh, level of leadership, um, both volunteers to disaster service workers, and we couldn't do it without you, so thank you for the helpers. Um, thank you to our community. We truly understand the deep sacrifice many of you are making and appreciate the resiliency and the compassion that you're showing to yourselves and to your family and to um, your neighbors. We depend on that in order to keep moving forward in these tough days ahead and they still will be tough for us. Um, also just to rem remind us that this will inequitably impact our neighbors, um, our most vulnerable communities, communities of color, low-income communities, persons experiencing homelessness, will be disproportionately affected by COVID-19. And we have been working since the beginning to build the supports and services needed um, to help people through the long haul of this incident. Um, and last but not least to my family and to the families of all the helpers who are out there, they share us with you um, in our emergency response. And I'm just truly thankful for all of the children and grandparents that are helping us um, navigate this space. In preparing for tonight, I went to my, um, my email, my Outlook, to see when did this first start um, happening for me? Because I think many of you have been experiencing this um, intensely since March. And I found on January 8th, I forwarded an email um, from, from California Department of Public Health to our communicable disease team. Um, and it was labeled outbreak of pneumonia of unknown etiology in, in Wuhan. And my, my email was short and it just said, it sounded like SARS to me. And that's when we really actively began monitoring this, this virus that we were seeing in this pneumonia picture we were seeing in China, where we, and some people might have seen it in the news late in uh, December, 2019, that there was something popping in China. Um, what that meant to us on a physical um, and an actual response basis was engaging our communicable disease team to begin building systems to monitor this and to work with our state partners and our regional partners to study what's happening because again, we always endeavor to be both fact-based and science-based in our policy making. And it was really challenging, as many of you know, know today, um, we were not getting information consistently on ne and not necessarily trustworthy information um, from, from China. And so really had to frame our analysis um, on the best resources and references that we had available at that time. But it obviously made um, 
planning our emergency response more challenging. Um, but again, as we in January, we truly began working in earnest with Bay Area health officials to study this disease, to determine what policy level decisions needed to be made to protect our community. We also began partnering with Marin Health, Kaiser Permanente, Southern Nevada, and our other healthcare preparedness program partners to ready them for action. Um, these partners have experienced both uh, SARS in, in the early 2000s, H1N1 in 2009, Ebola later on. So all of our systems have been ready to respond to pandemic like pandemics, um, but we quickly learned how, we, how much we had to much more rapidly um, respond and engage additional helpers and um, quickly began leading into our Office of Emergency Center, Office, Office of Emergency Services, and to partially activate our own emergency operating center to bring the support we needed to um, ex to accelerate our response um, for our community. Um, things became really clear the week of January 19th when we began seeing news of um, shutdowns of transportation in Wuhan, China, which really was the first main in indicator that this was very different than what was being reported out at that time. It was being reported as a as a pneumonia to be of, of concern and of interest, but not a public health emergency. And But when we saw that there was closures in China, it truly was a marker for us that we needed to even more um, bring more resources to bear to prepare our community to respond to this um, pandemic, what was to become a pandemic. It wasn't until February 25th that we accepted our first patient with COVID-19. This was someone that was from the Diamond Princess. You may have remembered it was a cruise that was in Japan. and. We accepted um, as part of a mutual aid response um, a patient to care for in one of our local hospitals. And honestly, that was it was a challenge to accept this patient, but it was a great practice for our system to begin preparing for what was inevitable that, that COVID-19 was going to be establish itself as a disease in our community and that we needed to prepare both our public health response and our healthcare system response to COVID-19. Things began quickly changing um, with that first acceptance. When we accepted that first patient, um, that the Grand Princess from the Mexican Riviera had already um, landed in San Francisco. And it wasn't until March that we received um, a manifest of the patients that were arriving from the Grand Princess Mexican Riviera. So what that's describing to you is that we've now received um, patients from all across the world, um, not just China, where there are more strict measures on suspending travel, but from different sources into Marin County. This was quickly followed again that we saw in the first week of March, having cases from New York City. And as you have now seen, the things have rapidly evolved from the beginning of March again, when you know, I'm really proud to be a deputy health officer of a county that um, decided to take aggressive swift action and to implement a shelter in place. It has literally has saved lives in our community and has bought us time, which is critical when a, in preparing for a pandemic. And I just wanted to, um, before, um, passing the baton, just talk about the shelter in place um, and where we stand now with shelter in place and, um, and some of the whys behind that. Um, so shelter in place really, as um, Supervisor Rice mentioned, it, it allows us one of our best tools, which is social distancing and implementing the strategies and enforcing the strategies that we do have control over to slow the spread of COVID-19 in our community. And that is a challenge for us. It is not our nature to restrict being social and especially we're in other countries in Asia like Singapore and South Korea it's a more acceptable um, mechanism to control the spread of disease it's been really challenging for our community understandably so especially for Marin County because we have so many vulnerable older adults who depend on social services and depend on social connectedness on every day I'm again just I'm so thankful for all of our community-based partners and our neighbors who have tried to provide those supports through a very, very difficult time. We firmly believe and know that our decision to shelter in place has begun flattening the curve in our community. Um, we have seen a much slower delay in the uptick of cases, um, confirmed positive COVID-19 cases. We see higher levels of hospitalizations and um, deaths in Marin County, but we know that is due to the older adult, the population who of our community, which is from we have more than 30% of our community are older adults. And that with this particular disease, we know that older adults will be disproportionately affected by um, and have more severe adverse outcomes due to COVID-19. Um, this shelter in place has allowed us, um, like I said, to decrease cases, to decrease hospitalizations, and to decrease deaths. And 
that has bought us time to, for our healthcare system to prepare for medical surge and also to blunt the size of the surge. So we um, are planning not to have the same, obviously not to see what we have seen in New York City and in Jersey with high levels of ER visits and hospitalizations and, and sadly deaths of, of many residents beyond proportions that were ever expected um, in New York City. The challenge now for us as health officers and health officials across the area is how to return to a new normal. We will not return to normal this year. Um, I do not anticipate us returning to normal next year. It is a new normal for us because we still need to buy time for tools to both treat, to develop and discover, to discover and develop tools to both treat this disease as well as to prevent through vaccination. And so we know that when we start loosening or um, creating more allowable activities in shelter in place that will result in increased cases of COVID-19, will result in increased cases of hospitalizations and increased, death, increased deaths in our community. So right now, um, today and twice a week now, health officers from across the Bay Area are having conversations, reviewing science, again, to be sure we're being science-driven to inform the policy considering the economic impacts and we very much it is with how to say it um it's, it affects our hearts to know that our shelter in place decisions are affecting local businesses business owners um residents who already were struggling to make um pay for the rent from paycheck to paycheck and we know the terrible impacts it's, it's having on our community to extend shelter in place um we are again planning to have a shelter in place extension, but identifying what are those allowable activities and having conversations that are with science emerging every, every day, honestly. Unfortunately, we are seeing a tremendous amount of publications and are striving to keep up with publications to inform our best practices and our best policy decisions. Um, there are things, there are conditions that we need to ensure um, are in place as we um, increase the allowable activities in our community. And first, and this will be, a, a, I think, a good transition to um, Dr. Ballard, is we need to ensure that we are prepared for medical surge. We need to ensure that our healthcare facilities have all the resources that they need, which includes both staff and supplies, so personal protective equipment for our healthcare workers and first responders to prepare for surge. We have seen what's happened in other communities that did not buy themselves time, and we need to take, make sure that we are fully prepared um, and analyze every model available to prepare for surge. Second, we need to fully optimize testing. What's different between COVID-19 now and flu every other year is we can test for flu. And then when people are diagnosed with flu, we can make sure they can stay at home and isolate and quarantine family members in order to um, build, slow the spread of flu in our community. And just to remember, this was a widespread flu year. So we were already impacted by flu significantly this year. And so we need to ensure that residents have access to both rapid testing, antibody testing to see if they have developed immunity due to exposure for COVID-19, exposure to COVID-19, um, as well as um, just basic laboratory testing. And that's, we have, unlike Zika, which we, another newly emerged disease, um, this is the fastest I've ever seen testing go online. And there's still struggles with the testing. Um, we, there's still, we know they have false, negative results, there's false positive results, and we know that this is one of our critical tools that needs to be available to um, increase the allowable activities under a shelter in place is have testing. Um, the second, the third is that we need to have a strong public health infrastructure. We are testing people because we want to be able to identify those individuals who need to be isolated and quarantined, both um, individuals who develop COVID-19 themselves and individuals who have had close um, contact, close household contact. And that's how, again, how we, if we, as we loosen up the shelter in place, we'll ensure that we can continue to slow the spread of this disease. And that's, again, making sure we have the public health nurses in place to make those phone interviews. We have over, um, I think, over 170 cases today. Every time we have a positive case in Marin County, a public health nurse contacts the family um, and contacts the individual to identify every possible exposure including occupational exposures, close household contacts and acquaintances, and exposures especially to vulnerable communities if they're working with older adults, for example. And that takes a team. And again, we're still working to build, build, build that team to be ready for a, a secondary surge. 
And I think that's where I'm just going to close um, my remarks. You may have already seen in the news that um, in China it's seeing a second wave, and that is what will happen in our community when we lift up a, the, our shelter in place, and it will be at an incremental level in the weeks to come. Um, we will continue to see surges or spikes in disease. And we know what we know the tools that slow that down. We know shelter in place is effective. We know that increasing um, the wearing of face covering in our community so we are not affecting others when we're out in the community is effective. And we know the basics of basic hand hygiene and, and respiratory etiquette will be critical throughout the summer. And I can't enforce enough that it, we will be relying, there will be a shift. When we shift away from shelter in place, the shift from public health policy will shift to you as our neighbors and our business community to make sure that you remain vigilant that all of the efforts you have done, and I applaud every one of them to have us line up and queue up six feet away from each other to limit people entering in, into your stores to ensure that we have prop, proper social distancing. We will need to double down on those efforts in the weeks to come as we start seeing changes in the shelter in place order. And again, I think this is a good time to transition because our primary goal is to protect our healthcare system and to protect, um, prevent medical surge in our community. So thank you everyone. I'm Justin Ballard. I'm uh, the, an emergency physician at Kaiser San Rafael. Uh, I'm also the medical director for the Marin Emergency Medical Services uh, uh, for the county. And I want, want to start by just thanking um, Matt and Lisa and all the people on the public health team uh, and that have been working for over 40 days in the Emergency Operations Center on this response. Uh, as Lisa noted, it started back in January and there was a lot of planning that went on uh, in January and February. Uh, and then it really uh, became like a full-time uh, full job in early March. Um, I wanna particularly uh, just reiterate that the shelter in place order that came out of the Bay Area, the first in the country, as you probably know, on March 16th, uh, and was a precursor to those in California uh, and then across the country, was critically important for protecting our citizens. Um, and I will uh, lay out three tangible benefits for Marin County, uh, which would also apply to the, to the Bay Area. And the first is it allowed us the time to put systems into place to protect our healthcare workers. Um, and this, uh, as you know, is critically important to being able to provide safety to the system for if and when we see a surge, and I agree with Lisa, there will be surges along the way, uh, so that we have the personnel that are healthy and protected that will be able to care for you and your loved ones. So that was critically important. Uh, second, it allowed uh, all of our providers uh, in Marin County uh, and, and beyond time to do search planning and do it in a way where they could be thoughtful about it and collaborative and be able to be able to build out that hospital capacity, the video visit capacity, a lot of the different services that have come online because we've had a little bit more time and have not been in, inundated uh, right off the bat. And then finally, and speaking as an emergency physician, it's given us time to learn how to treat people who have this disease because it is very unique. Uh, there are unique laboratory findings. Uh, there are unique treatment modalities. Uh, usually patients with a bad pneumonia, we will usually give them fluids through IV, but in this particular disease, that can make it worse. Uh, usually patients with very low oxygen would be put on the ventilator right away. We're learning now that patients with COVID-19, especially if they're younger, they can have very low oxygen levels and be fine for a long period of time. So we've learned a lot how, about how to treat these uh, patients, which will be a benefit not only for our system, but for, for patients and loved ones. Um, so just to give you some detail where we're at, I think it's useful to run through where we've made progress so far. And it starts with the hospitals and the care providers here in Marin County. They quickly built out phone visits and video visits to allow for patients to get into touch with their providers so they didn't have to come to a medical facility and be scared about, about what they might be exposed to when they did and to keep our providers safe as well. Uh, they also canceled all elective surgeries very early on in March to free up capacity, both the providers, but also operating rooms and other spillover space that could be used should there be a surge. Um, and they started to work collaboratively to make plans to reach out uh, to vulnerable uh, patients in our community uh, and patients in nursing homes and other places where we really worry about the potential spread of COVID-19. So that was uh, the hospitals. And then 
and work that I've been involved with um, and in collaboration with the, with the comms center and dispatch, uh, we worked on putting screening procedures into place, uh, having our dispatchers ask over the phone when someone called if there had been a travel history or if there were symptoms. And these evolved really quickly because as this disease did, first we were only worried about people traveling from China and then we added on Italy and, and Iran, some other countries. And then next thing you know, we're, we're really uh, having to suspect any respiratory complaint or any fever complaint or any patient that just is weak. Um, it, it, this disease can present a lot, a lot of different ways. Um, and then we worked to make sure that our uh, first responders and our EMS were safe when they arrived so that they got notification ahead of time if the patient might be someone who could be at risk so they could put on their proper PPE. And we told them not to do certain procedures uh, such as albuterol uh, nebulizer in the back of the rig um, to use an inhaler instead because procedures like that can be higher risk uh, for the providers. And then our emergency departments worked out workflows so they would meet ambulances outside and transition a different workflow than normal for them, put them into negative pressure rooms and develop really clean, safe workflows. And I'm, I'm really proud of, you know, particularly of my emergency department, but also just in talking a bunch with um, the docs at Nevada Community and Rind and Rind Health uh, Medical Center. They've just done an amazing job to make these, um, uh, these transitions and these care areas safe. I know Marin Health has built out a whole new airway room and two new uh, negative pressure rooms uh, in their ED, and this is their old ED. Uh, and then finally upstairs, uh, there's been a ton of work going on at all three medical centers to uh, work on surge capacity to empty out beds to make sure that both ICU beds, but also spillover beds, as I mentioned earlier, might be available um, should there be a, a surge of patients. So far, we've been really lucky. We are at, at record lows in terms of uh, EMS transports, uh, ED capacity, and hospital capacity. So we've been in a lull right now, just waiting to see um, when we will be hit. But it's been a very valuable lull because of the planning that's gone into this. And I think um, part of that planning, a big part of that planning, is the work that Chief Brown um, has been leading uh, with surge planning and with an alternate care site. So I think this is probably a good time to turn it over uh, to him. And uh, there you go, Chief Brown. Thank you, Dr. Ballard. Uh, my name is Mark Brown, and it's uh, my honor to serve as the Deputy Fire Chief for the Marin County Fire Department. Um, just a wonderful community of professionals to work with in pre-hospital care, in hospital care, um, and all the emergency management. And um, it's been a pleasure to watch public health to step up and, and provide the leadership that has been um, kept our community safe. Uh, from the very beginning of this pandemic, we've been using existing plans that have been built for years and get updated on a regular basis. The two primary plans that we're following is the pandemic plan, which lays out all the steps that you've been watching on uh, public health uh, engage in as far as uh, social distancing, testing, contact tracing, all of that is part of the pandemic plan. It's been working very well. And then the next plan that we've been evaluating is the medical uh, healthcare surge plan. And that's where we've had the North Bay IMT engaged in evaluating that plan and uh, making sure that it was um, accurate and then making it specific to this current pandemic rather than just a general surge. And there's four key levels that we look at in that surge plan, minor surge, moderate surge, critical surge, and catastrophic surge. And then there's three areas that we need to look at when we talk about surge. There's pre-hospital care surge or your fire engines and your ambulances responding to incidents. Your, there's your in-hospital surge, and then there's surge once the um, hospitals can no longer take care of the patients they have within their property, and it's when all the hospitals can't handle that surge. So let me talk about pre-hospital surge for a little bit. Um, as Dr. Ballard mentioned, we've had just a tremendous amount of close coordination with EMS and Dr. Ballard specifically. Um, daily conference calls with our fire rescue branches at nine o'clock in the morning to discuss the personal protective equipment that our responders need, the dispatch policies, the treatment modalities. And this has really allowed us to keep our responders safe. And if we keep our responders safe, then that allows us to keep the patients in the back of the ambulance safe. And so that's been um, just uh, the biggest step that we've made in pre-hospital care. All the fire agencies are um, working on this as one. We have a group that's working together as an area coordination group, and we are making sure that all the fire agencies are responding in a consistent model and that we're all doing everything the same way. Uh, we have um, cleaning, 
processes at each of our stations to make sure that when the firefighters come in from home and they go into the fire station, uh, they are clean and they're not transferring any uh, infection they may have gotten at home into the fire station. And that same cleaning process happens every time they go on a call or they go out to the public. We've also established um, ambulance disinfection locations. Maybe if you've been near any of the three hospitals in Marin, you've seen um, some tents and the ambulances pull up, people going up and disinfecting the ambulances. And that's again to create a safe environment for our people to work in. And it's also to make sure that if we had a patient that had an infection in one transport, it can't get transferred to a patient that is in the next transport. And then we need to worry about uh, call volume increasing. At the same time, we might be getting sick firefighters and uh, paramedics. And so we've created a response plan that takes into account an increased call volume at the same time looking at um, losing healthcare workers. And so we have a um, decision matrix that takes into account how long an ambulance is waiting to transfer a patient to the ED, because that's usually a good indication of our call volume. How many of our ambulances are responding at the same time? And are we having delays in getting ambulances to, uh, to respond? And then we have uh, drawdowns with the percentage of um, firefighters and paramedics who are available to work compared to who aren't available to work. So this is how we've made sure that we can keep up to, with the surge in a pre-hospital care environment. Then the second part of this we were talking about is surge within the hospitals. And we currently feel that we are based on our plans that we're in minor surge right now and transitioning into moderate surge for the in-hospital care. And so that means, as Dr. Ballard mentioned, that uh, routine medical care um, elective procedures has, have been discontinued, uh, doing remote medicine via uh, teleconferences just like this one. Um, and being able to prescribe medication, so on and so forth, without patients having to come into the hospital. Um, and then the, the hospitals have done an incredible job of increasing their bed space by approximately 67%. And it's not just um, regular, regular beds they've increased. They've increased the critical care beds. They've increased uh, negative pressure and isolation beds. So um, right now, as Dr. Ballard mentioned, we are seeing historic lows for um, patient census. So that's really setting us up well for a surge that we may have. And so the steps of minor surge are helping us stay away from moderate surge. Uh, part of moderate surge is setting up the field treatment sites that are out in, if you drive by any of these hospitals, you'll see some tents and stuff outside. Those are field treatment sites that can help triage patients as they come in and decide which way we need to send them. And then um, as you've been seeing in the news across the state, across the country, skilled nursing facilities and residential care facilities are a tremendous challenge. And so public health has been working closely with all the hospitals and with all of the uh, skilled nursing facilities, residential care facilities to ensure that some of the worst case scenarios that you've seen across the state and the country do not happen here in Marin. Uh, we've been in, inserting uh, uh, healthcare workers into these facilities to help bolster that staff so that we can keep the patients there instead of having them have to leave their current locations and enter into the hospital system. So those are some of the steps that we're doing to make sure that we don't go from minor surge to moderate surge. And then there's critical surge, which is the next level, which means the development of alternate care sites. And that's the plan that the North Bay Incident Management Team has been working very hard on. And what I do want to emphasize now is that we are currently ahead of the surge. And we are using modeling and current data at the hospitals to monitor where we are in that curve and where we are in that surge. And we will continue to stay ahead of that surge. So what the North Bay Incident Management Team has done is taken the um, alternate care site plan and again specified it to COVID-19. So we are creating an alternate care site that can take up to 400 patients and we've made it scalable. So we don't have to um, create a site that can take all 400 at once. We'll create 25 beds at a time until we get, reach to the point that we've uh, no longer need to create those beds. Um, and we can make that site for either be COVID positive patients or COVID negative. And our decision point for hospitals to start using an ultimate care site is when they reach, start reaching 90% of their capacity. And it could be overall capacity or it could be capacity within their critical care beds. And we can also use an ultimate care site should we have something catastrophic occur at skilled nursing facilities, we can transfer the patients from the skilled nursing facilities to the ultimate care site. And then the last level is the catastrophic surge. And again, 
you know, all the steps that we are taking is designed to keep us from ever getting into catastrophic surge. Um, but what it means is if we can no longer take care of all the patients that are in, in, in our hospitals and in our alternate care site, that's when we need to start going to regional alternate care sites. And throughout the Bay Area and um, the, this, the region of Northern California, thousands of additional bed space have been created at alternate care sites. And we are coordinating with the Medical Resource Control Center and the State Operations Center to ensure that we have access to those sites. So in a nutshell, that's what we're doing to keep uh, the public prepared and keep us ahead of their surge curve. Back to you, Elaine. Thank you so much um, to all of our panelists for, um, you know, giving us a really solid informational update on what's going on here in Marin. For those of you that joined us a bit late, um, this is Marin County Health and Human Services Community Conversation. We are here with Supervisor Katie Rice, Dr. Lisa Santora, Dr. Dustin Ball Ballard, and also Mark Brown. And we're talking about hospital surge, which is that point at which a significant emergency like COVID-19 creates a demand that surpasses the capacity of our hospitals, our long-term uh, long care facilities, and other medical services. And so now we're going to transition uh, into our, our question and answer period. And I want to thank all the members of the public that submitted questions late last night or early this morning. Um, we received um, many more questions than we're actually able to address here this evening. Um, and so we apologize in advance for that, but we have tried to group them by theme and we hope to knock out as many as we can. If for some reason we do not get a chance to answer your specific question in the time that we have left, feel free to reach out to us. Um, we have our COVID-19 hotline, which is available at 415-473-7191. That's Monday through Friday, 9.30 a.m. to 12, and again, 1 to 5. And we also have our um, email response team. You can reach out to us at COVID-19 at MarinCounty.org and also have your non-medical questions answered in that way. So now we're going to go ahead and dive into our Q&A. And I'm going to start with uh, Dr. Santora. We received uh, a number of questions around COVID-19 testing. And we know that Marin County Public Health opened its own drive through testing facility in Marin. We know that other hospitals are conducting testing. And I believe you announced at the top of our, our webinar here that about 2,145 people had been tested, yet that's less than about 1% of our population. So a lot of the questions we received are, you know, why so few tests at this point? Are there barriers in place to which um, we can expand testing? Will there be testing available for everyone at some point, um, or have we done enough testing? Thank you, Lainey. Um, no, we have not done enough testing. This is one of our top priorities. Like I mentioned earlier, testing is one of the strategies that will allow us to um, reduce the shelter in place orders while still not creating a surge, an unnecessary surge on our system. There are supply chain challenges along every step of the way for testing. I'm really proud that Marin County led the way in standing up its own testing. Um, as of early this week, we had the highest per capita testing um, available, I completed in per county in the Bay Area. That might have changed. Um, that's because we are having new systems and new laboratories coming online. So um, up to one point, we were responsible for more than three quarters of testing done in Marin County was done through public health, through our field-based testing. We were dependent first on who were the laboratory facilities that were going to accept testing? And that depended first on testing kits being available. So testing kits need to be approved by the Federal Drug Administration, Food and Drug Administration, the Federal Food and Drug Administration, the FDA, and they need to be approved before those tests go online. And then we experienced lags in getting those kits into Marin County, into our public health lab. So we had to begin partnering with the state on testing. And then there's something that we called um, Operation Long Sticks. Um, we didn't have enough nasopharyngeal swabs. And that is the primary test where we um, have swabs and we place uncomfortable, uncomfortably so swabs up your nose to test. And those swabs are predominantly manufactured in China and in Italy. And so the pandemic affected that supply chain of swabs. And that's something we still, every single day, are seeing sufficient enough swabs to test. Fortunately, we are seeing a change over the past two weeks, which have allowed us to almost double our testing in the, in the past two weeks. And that's because we have had our healthcare systems 
Kaiser, Sutter, and Marin Health go online with their own testing. We've seen the introduction of rapid testing in our community, and we're also starting to see now the introduction of antibody testing. And that is something that we hope to see increase and double every week in the weeks to come to make sure that every individual now, and Dr. Ballard mentioned this earlier, um, who presents even with mild symptoms, and we're seeing people that are asymptomatic or just have mild symptoms where they can't smell their coffee, um, may have COVID-19. And so we wanna make sure that every resident has access to that. And that's one of our top priorities. So let's talk a bit more about um, the notion of antibody testing. Can you provide for our public an overview of what that is and how soon that might become available and what role will that play in our COVID-19 surveillance efforts? Antibody testing shows us your immune response to COVID-19. And so You've been infected and if you've developed immunity and we we always use these testing especially for vaccine preventable diseases to make sure um, before you enter school or before you enter a workforce as a healthcare worker to show that you have immunity to certain diseases like measles measles but right now in the antibody testing we're seeing false negatives in, in a current antibody testing because they're new tests and so we need time to do more antibody testing and doing it at a population health, population level so we can see um, so we can test this test and show that it's an effective test to show um, the immune status of an individual and also to do research of how long do people stay immune. And once you've been infected with COVID-19, how long will you be immune to a future version of COVID-19? So there's a lot of research that needs to be done. And then it also informs us in the future, what's the level of herd immunity? And that's one of our challenges. We want to increase the herd immunity. So that's the, usually it's over 70% at least, but ideally over 90% of our population um, will have some immunity to COVID-19, which significantly slows the spread of COVID-19 in our community. So a lot of information to be gathered, but they're just to caution their new tests and they're not widely available yet. Thank you, Dr. Santora. Um, Dr. Ballard, maybe you can help with this one. Um, you know, to date, uh, Marin County has been releasing data really only on our cumulative hospitalizations, but I know that there's some new data that provides clarification on that. I'm wondering if you can um, help demystify, you know, what we're seeing in terms of hospitalizations around COVID-19. What are the age range of patients affected? You know, are we, are our ICU units heavily impacted? Um, and any other data that you have that really provides a, an accurate up-to-date look at what our hospitals are experiencing right now? Thing. Yeah, um, those are great questions. I, I can understand why people um, are concerned about this. Obviously, there's been a lot of uh, attention that's been paid to both ICU level, uh, ICU level care as well as ventilators as uh, treatments for severe COVID-19. Um, and they, it, it's true that is the those are the two um, at, at the end of the line treatments that are, are most critical. However, there are a lot of treatments that are emerging before that. Um, that can be effective, such as high flow oxygen, high flow humidified oxygen, or even home monitoring with home oxygen and home pulse oximetry. Um, so keep that in mind. Our ability to manage people outside of the hospital is getting much better as we learn more about COVID-19. Um, what we've seen is, you know, the mix of our, I believe we have 29 hospitalizations in Marin County, um, you know, since the, uh, the original hospitalization from the Diamond Princess. Uh, and they have evolved because initially these people were being admitted sometimes with rather mild symptoms, but they had a travel history that was concerning and they were kept in the hospital for a while, sometimes five or six days while we waited for that test to come back. But what's happened subsequently is that uh, the providers here in Marin County have come online with faster tests, uh, sometimes as fast as you know, six to eight hours in terms of turnaround time. Um, and even the, you know, the county test uh, is becoming much faster turnaround time, 24 to 48 hours. So we're not seeing as many patients like that who are just in the hospital because they're waiting for a test uh, before they get released. Uh, so uh, we've really seen a flattening of the hospitalizations as well as the critically ill patients. Uh, the patients that were uh, coming on the ventilators were, you know, were early on, you know, older for sure, uh, but certainly a, a mix, as you saw, you know, Dr. Uh, Dr. Willis is a you know healthy gentleman. I won't really uh, I won't uh, reveal his exact age, but he's not that much older than me, and he's a you know uh, a high level cyclist, and he got you know fairly sick as you could see from his videos. Um, so it's not just the uh, it's not just the older people, uh, and in terms of older people, it's not 
you know, it, some of them have very mild illness. I mean, there are a couple 90 year olds um, in our uh, in our hospital that did quite well, you know, very, you know, very benign course. So um, what we're seeing, you know, as a general trend is that the hospitals hospitalizations have leveled off in terms of the rate of rise. Um, and, and same with the critically ill people on the ventilators. Um, and we have excellent ventilator capacity right now, about 30% capacity of the ventilators that are normally online. Um, and the system of that doesn't necessarily account for all the surge ventilators that could be put into play if we needed them. Um, so I hope that answered the question. Yeah, really helpful information. Thank you, Dr. Ballad. Um, you mentioned, uh, you know, you, you brought up the, the fact of how this might affect older adults. and. Um, Dr. Santora and Mark Brown, I wonder if you uh, might want to tackle this question together, although, um, Mark, I know you, you brought this up to some degree. You know, our local news media has really been focusing on the impact of COVID-19 cases in our senior living facilities, um, not only just Marin, but around the Bay Area. So, in addition to the, the proactive steps that Mark ex, uh, discussed, um, can you expand on, um, you know, what kind of testing is taking place in our skilled nursing facilities? And when a, an individual in a, a senior residential facility tests positive, you know, what are the steps that are taken to come alongside that facility and, um, and help them, you know, take the right responsible action? Give a start and Mark, you can just help if I miss anything. Um, this has been a top priority. There's many top priorities, but this has um, been a top concern of ours since the beginning of this um, pandemic. Um, we know that due to the nature of the, the facilities themselves, their congregate settings, so it's people, many people in a small amount of space often, and then caregivers who may work at multiple different facilities um, who are providing direct care to individuals at both boarding care, um, assisted living facilities, and um, nurse, nursing homes or skilled nursing facilities, that these individuals, again, due to their age and their chronic conditions, we're, are mo we're most vulnerable and will continue to be our most vulnerable populations. So from the beginning, we began issuing guidance to the facilities, um, accelerating our rep recommendations for um, suspending visitations, implementing um, temperature screenings, and um, working across, again, all of the facilities in Marin County to um, encourage them and guide them to implement as, as aggressive mitigation strategies as possible to slow the spread of the disease um, in their communities. That being said, despite our best efforts, we've already seen multiple facilities have outbreaks and we have been working with um, Kaiser and Marin Health to one, to be able to deploy um, mobile assessment and triage and testing to teams to sites where um, it might be one patient or one staff member who is identified because they just call their doctor and then are diagnosed with COVID-19. As I mentioned earlier, that one positive test results in a call from our public health nurse to identify if they have any sensitive occupation, which includes working in assisted living facilities or nursing homes, um, because we know the vulnerability of these communities. And then um, trying to bring down all of the resources, um, protective, um, personal protective equipment, training um, for staff um, who are not healthcare providers. Um, we have our skilled nursing facilities, which are licensed facil medical facilities, but we have our our residential care facilities, which are licensed care facilities who don't have medical staff on board. So really um, trying over the past, especially over the past two weeks, um, doubling down, tripling down our efforts to provide the support to, to these facilities. So we don't see what we've seen in other communities is that insufficient numbers of staff are, are present and not able to care for the residents on site. Yeah, there's some stuff I can add to that is that um, for the surge planning, what's been important for us is to watch what's going on throughout the state, throughout the country. Uh, when we first started the surge planning, we thought our greatest threat was the hospitals becoming inundated and patients coming out of the hospitals and then going into the ultimate care site. And then watching what happened in Riverside and, and in other areas, we had to shift that plan and to, to realize that our greatest threat was probably from the skilled nursing facility. So the plan has been modified uh, to consider both threats from hospital or from the skilled nursing facility. So we're prepared for both and we're setting up a tabletop exercise so that all those stakeholders that are in the plan will know exactly what to do should we exercise that portion of the plan. And Mark, for our viewers, can you give me a quick overview? What is a tabletop exercise? Tabletop exercise will be everyone has been briefed on the plan. Um, 
the different people that would have a role in making decisions to implement phases of the plan would be uh, normally it would be around the tabletops, and, but since we have social distancing, it would be in a WebEx, just very similar to this. And um, uh, role player A is going to say, you know what, I have five patients that I need to transfer from this skilled nursing facility. And role player B says, okay, this is the steps that you need to take. And then uh, you just go through the different counterparts so that they know what actions they have to take so that when it's real life, it's not the first time they've done it. Great. Thanks for providing that clarity. Um, Mark, you mentioned during your earlier remarks um, efforts to um, really keep our EMS personnel safe as they uh, during that pre hospital stage and um, making sure that they not only are protected in case of a potential exposure, but then reducing that chance of um, you know, carrying that exposure to another patient. I'm curious. I know um, that our, our fire personnel are often who staff our EMS units. So have there been any firefighters yet that have been affected by this, maybe have had to be quarantined or have tested positive? Can you provide some clarity on that? So um, from the beginning to now, we've had um, 41 firefighters who've been, or paramedics, first responders who have been quarantined. Um, actually, as late as today, we had two that were placed under quarantine based on a person under investigation that was transported. And um, to Dr. Ballard's points about how quick the testing has occurred, that patient was transported reported at noon and we got the results at six o'clock tonight that they were negative. So um, that quarantine lasted about an hour. Um, but, so that's real good news. But so far, none of our firefighters have tested positive. We have had a total of four people that have been involved in the response test positive and all of them have, are actually have seen their symptoms either completely go away or, or nearly completely go away. That's good news. That's good news. So as we talk about um, hospital surge planning, um, you know, and, and you know, the, the notion of flattening the curve, we received a tremendous amount of questions on where are we on that curve? And especially a number of people have on their minds the shelter in place order, um, schools being canceled through um, you know, the end of the school year. So is there any clarity that we can provide on where we are in that, um, in that curve process? And uh, with things going so well so far in terms of flattening the curve, when do we expect that that um, shelter in place order might be lifted, especially if we're hearing um, similar conversations out of Washington or even from the state. So what's Marin's take on that? And I'm going to leave that open to whoever would like to tackle that question. I'll go first. <laughs> one. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the health officers immediately upon extending the shelter in place um, through May 3rd began conversations about um, returning to our new normal. How do we begin unwinding the shelter in place in a science driven way that um, considers the balance of both the risk of continued shelter in place um, and to the benefits of continuing to shelter in place. The challenge right now is in some ways we're, we've been successful. We're seeing a much slower increase in cases. Um, we've seen what's happened in New York and uh, New Jersey, where it was a much ra more rapid increase in cases after return travel from Europe um, in that February month. Um, because we implemented the shelter in place measures, we, we've been successful. What that does, though, and I just like to say it's not a band aid that I would have ever wanted to rip off. If we did not have those measures, we would have much more quickly gone through the phases that um, Chief um, Brown described, and that would not be preferable in any way. It then becomes challenging for us now that it's it's delayed. And so every week, like I mentioned, the health officers are reviewing um, emerging research and data. And trying to identify strategies to um, have al allowable activities. Um, and so us, the best I can say is that in the weeks to come, I, I anticipate an extension of shelter in place, so a modified version of that uh, shelter in place. Um, and it may be, we knew that there's gonna be a month long version, um, this version, and I think we will be looking at different timelines for sheltering in place. Again, as we also share, we all share desire to return to our new normal. But again, very much grounded in this in accepting that that policy decision to return to a new normal will result in more hospitalizations and deaths in our community.
I think Dr. Sartora did a great job, but I'm open to any other additional comments our other panelists may have before I move on to uh, wrapping up our final questions. I'll just add something um, real quickly, uh, Lainey. Um, and I think there are millions of people who have read uh, the Medium post called the, uh, the Hammer and the Dance. Um, and uh, I know in some communications with Dr. Wells today, he referenced this and how we're getting to the dance part of this where the hammer has been successful. And just um, by way of comparison, Santa Clara, uh, they were the first uh, Bay Area County really to be hit by this. And they noticed that their testing positive rate was hitting 10, 11%. And that really triggered the, um, the action across the entire Bay Area. And if you look at their total cases and where they are in the curve, their curve is flattening as well, but they've had um, you know, many percent higher total cases just because they were a little farther along. So the dance, I think, is something that should be coordinated ideally across the entire Bay Area because we're interconnected. And that makes it even more challenging because what might work, um, at least partially here in Marin, with, you know, greater physical distancing and, and um, better air quality and such is not necessarily going to work exactly the same elsewhere. So it's, um, it, it, it's a dance everywhere, and then you've taken that entire sort of integrated um, area like the Bay Area with a lot of uh, commuters, it becomes even more of a delicate dance. What I like to add is that um, as uh, the curve starts to flatten, um, when it comes to surge planning and pre-hospital care, we are not letting our guard down. We will use that time to continue to refine our plans, make them better, make them more specific to the current situation uh, for the inevitable rise if, um, that we seen across the country or across the world. And, and Lainey, I, I think I'd like to add something too. I, I think there's, you know, if, if there's a couple big takeaways to this evening's conversation, um, you can call it that, is that one, we've done such an incredible job here in Marin. Um, the shelter in place has worked. It bought so much time. I think Dr. Ballard really described well what the hospitals and our healthcare system has been able to do. And it's not just about building capacity, it was also that planning piece and putting in systems and programs to help with the other kind of medical needs that any community needs. So um, we've just really done a tremendous job and, and um, we, there, will be, there are fruits that will be born from it. But the, the second takeaway is, is that um, while we get to look ahead towards a loosening of the shelter in place and a lifting of it, it's not going to be all at once. It is likely going to be gradual, phased in. There may even be fits and starts. Um, and I think that the public, the community needs to be ready, needs to understand that, as uh, Dr. Centaur said, we're not going to go back to a complete normal for quite a while. Um, and for many folks, and I'm thinking about our seniors, our, our most vulnerable, until there's a vaccine in place, they're not going to. Um, say at all um, with COVID-19 around. And so it's going to be a scary time for them for a long time. But we will be able to, and in, not, in the not so distant future, I'm, I'm hearing, start to see some relaxation of the shelter in place, as long as then we continue as individuals to do all the right things around hand washing, around the social distancing, as businesses, we follow the practices. So we're just going to have to continue to look to our um, public health officials, and hopefully in sync with the rest of the region because so much of our lives cross these county lines um, and continue to, to um, follow their instructions and, um, and, and be thankful and grateful to each other for what we've accomplished because um, as we've said many times, we, what we've done is save lives and is gonna save lives in the future as well. Wonderful, great, thank you for that, um, for all those great remarks. And um, unfortunately, we are about out of time for what we had planned today, but I do want to thank everyone for tuning in. I want to thank our four panelists, Supervisor Rice, Dr. Santora, Dr. Ballard, and uh, Ch Deputy Chief Brown for joining us and sharing with them some of their wisdom and behind the scenes insight on what exactly is taking place in Marin with regard to preparing for hospital surge. Again, I realized there were a lot of questions that were submitted that unfortunately we didn't have a chance to um, address and also questions that didn't pertain to this topic, but we've certainly hung on to them for a future town hall meeting. Um, if you do have general questions about coronavirus in Marin, I encourage you to visit the coronavirus in Marin website at marinhhs.org slash coronavirus or marinhhs.org slash coronavirus.es. If you are um, 
reaching out to us and looking for Spanish information. In addition, you can visit that website and subscribe for um, daily status updates from the Public Health Department regarding exactly the latest data on our COVID-19 cases in Marin, as well as other updates about actions the county is taking to respond to COVID-19. Um, you can get those by going to the visit to our website and clicking on the subscribe button, or we have new today an opportunity to receive those updates by text. You can subscribe by texting Marin COVID to the number 468-311. I wanna remind everybody, I realize we had a few um, issues, those that we're trying to watch via the website. This entire webinar is recorded and we will be posting it to our YouTube channel tomorrow. So if you wanna be able to look back and watch it, um, first thing tomorrow morning, uh, you certainly can do that. And we also will have it archived on our Facebook page. And we look forward to hosting another community conversation in the near future. Again, thank you everybody for tuning in on being informed on this important topic. And we look forward to connecting with you all again very soon. Thank you and good night.